People is with Planning Board for Tuesday, June 15, 2010. Uh, there are seven, seven members present, so we have a quorum. I'd like to formally welcome Carol Ann Jordan to the board. Thank you. Uh, first item on our agenda tonight is uh, minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, if anyone's, everyone, everyone's had a chance to read those through, I'd uh, like to offer up any comments, thoughts, suggestions, or a motion. Barbara? Um, no, one question. Oh, it's on the fifth page, the, uh, about the seventh line down, in response to her question, Ms. O'Meara confirmed that parking is not allowed on any, oh, any of the paved surface. Excuse me. I didn't read it properly. Okay. It said paved. I retract. Okay. That's it. So no other corrections? I move to accept. I have one very minor oh, correction. Yeah. Very yeah. minor. Go ahead. I almost didn't bring it up. On page one, Ms. Ballant nominated Ms. Founder. I nominated Ms. Bond. Okay. It's not mine. Very. Not substantive. <laughs> it's funny because I had it written one way and I heard it on the tape. This voice sounded like yours and I didn't know which way to go. So clearly I stepped up. Whether she likes it or not, she is the vice chair. So. <laughs> um, with those corrections, any. Um, I believe we have a motion to, to approve them. Any seconds? Elaine, we have a motion uh, made by Barbara Schenkel and seconded by Elaine Fallender. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Motion to approve the minutes passes. Next item on the agenda we have is the Shore Road Private Access Way Resource Protection Permit. Uh, I would like to make one announcement. Rudy's uh, amendment has been withdrawn. The applicant has withdrawn their request for amend an amendment to their site plan. So that is not on the agenda. If you are here for that item, it will not be called tonight. It's not before the board. If it is resubmitted, um, whoever got notice the first time will get notice again. Do you have a question, sir? Rudy's, the Rudy's site plan amendment. I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to confuse people. I called one, but I wanted to make that announcement first. So if anyone's here for that, there's nothing to be heard. So back to the uh, agenda that we do have. First item is the Shore Road Private Access Way Permit. Um, MC Associates is requesting a private access way permit and a resource protection permit for a lot located at 1055 Shore Road, section 19-7-9, private access, access way permit, public hearing, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit, public hearing. If the applicant could step up to the podium, introduce themselves, and make their presentation, the board will consider the application. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Whitten of Caradine Consultants. I'm a civil engineer representing uh, MC Associates for their permitting and design uh, features of this project. Uh, MC Associates uh, is not in the building tonight, and uh, I'm their sole representative uh, for this meeting. We are looking at a small lot of 30. Uh, Okay, <laughs> a 33,000 square foot lot at 1055 Shore Road. Uh, the location map is up here. It is uh, Delano Park neighborhood it's on the right side of this map, and the uh, Dyer Pond subdivision is to the northwest of the property. There's a single family lot uh, that's here, and there's this small piece uh, that's shown on the map, but it's actually a large piece of property. It's actually uh, owned by the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust uh, and is a uh, conserved woodland uh, property. Shore Road runs down the middle of the, this map. So again, right, we're here with a shaded property, 33,000 square feet in size approximately. The property has uh, 100 feet along the road, along, along Shore Road, and approximately 150 feet of depth uh, away from Shore Road. As you can see from the grading, the existing uh, topography, there is a high point uh, in this location that's a ledge outcrop. There are also two other ledge crop outcrops on the property. Uh, generally, the topography slopes towards Shore Road, and there is a wetland area that bisects the property uh, through here. It's a narrow channel of wetlands. It conveys stormwater from an uh, upgradient wetland on the uh, woodland side through the property to a small ponding area here um, and through a 24-inch existing culvert under Shore Road. And um, 
We are proposing a private access way through um, the provisions in the ordinance that uh, state that we can come in for an access way permit if uh, this lot does not meet the current standards for road uh, frontage, which it does not. The current standard is 125 feet. We have 100 feet, as I previously mentioned. Uh, so we are looking to put in approximately 160 foot private access way that will be paved to a 14 foot width. We'll have gravel shoulders to an 18 foot width, which is uh, to the ordinance, and uh, we'll intersect Shore Road uh, in this area. To establish proper stopping site distance in either direction, uh, we need to remove, uh, as stated in, in a letter from a traffic engineer from T.Y. Lynn, we need to remove uh, a certain volume of rock, of ledge, from this area that I'm pointing to on the screen. Uh, this will allow for proper stopping site distance for any car waiting in the driveway to pull out and take a right-hand turn uh, or a left-hand turn, but as they look right up Shore Road. Uh, this will establish uh, min the, the minimum, uh, if not over, the 250 feet of stopping site distance. The other direction has over 270 feet of stopping site distance, and that is above the uh, ordinance standard for such a roadway. Uh, we have provided a uh, access uh, turnaround area, a hammerhead turnaround in this area, a uh, B40, which is a 40-foot uh, long tour bus, can actually pull in here, back up, and pull out uh, using the, uh, the entire roadway surface to get out. That is um, what I understand is the uh, standard from the fire chief, and uh, we have provided turning templates to uh, AMEC Engineering and to Maureen today uh, for their review. Obviously, um, we, that was not in time for your packets. But uh, we have given that to AMEC for their review. And uh, this will be uh, a porous pavement, and I will talk more about that later. The other part of the development that we've uh, kind of thrown out into the future, e even though this permit is for just a private access way, it will obviously serve a single family home. And we've put in uh, what we believe is ample uh, maneuvering area for vehicles to get up to a, a two car garage and uh, a sizable uh, single home building structure for, uh, for the potential owner of this property in the future. Uh, NC Associates is not planning on building uh, the house itself or, um, and will be selling it to someone to build. Uh, this lot has been in existence for many years, uh, at least through the uh, early 60s. It's been in, in the ownership of NC Associates. And uh, obviously it was created prior to the current zoning. It, it is a non-conforming lot, uh, both due to road frontage and to lot area. And the non-conforming setbacks uh, are illustrated on this plan. We have 25 foot front and side setbacks and a uh, 20 foot rear setback, I believe. And that opens up the building envelope a little bit more than the last plan that we showed you. We had the current setbacks last time we were in front of you, and that really squeezed uh, the building in. And uh, from comments from the board, it was, it was not a very uh, pleasing <laughs> building structure that we had shown in there. So uh, I'm no architect, but I did try to put a little spin on, on the uh, building and show you that uh, there is a little bit of room to, uh, to make, make a reasonably uh, looking house in this area. Uh, the wetland comes through the property, as I mentioned. Uh, we are proposing to fill now 243 square feet of wetland, whereas last time we were in front of you, we were talking about a whole uh, 270 uh, square feet. And uh, to put that in perspective, uh, an average parking space, 10 by 20 parking space with, with its aisle, takes up 320 square feet. So we're filling in less wetland than it takes for a parking space uh, in an average uh, parking lot. And we've been to the Conservation Commission, and they voted three to one to recommend uh, that the board you know, could approve that if they wanted to. And uh, I believe that's in a memo to the board. Uh, we are, since we last talked to you, uh, we've met with, uh, with the planner and the town engineer with AMEC and with the public works director and with uh, the design engineer of the pathway as well. And we talked about the intersection of this driveway, uh, drainage along Shore Road, and the coordination of the pathway. And the result of that conversation was that 
the uh, MC Associates is going to extend their ditch into the town right of way with their blasting plan. With their what? With their blasting plan. If, if ledge is needed to be removed to, to su successfully do this, uh, the applicant is willing to do that. We, are, we have extended the grading such that we will be picking up stormwater drainage from Shore Road, directing it onto the property and through this proposed 15-inch uh, culvert. The culvert will also accept flows from this wetland, redirect it uh, down a vegetated swale to the culvert, and uh, redirect it to its existing outlet from the property into the ponded area and through the culvert as it does today. Uh, the slope of this natural ground is around 6%, 6 to 7 percent. The slope of our, of our culvert is a little over 4 percent. Our stormwater calculations, uh, we feel, back that up and that we've designed this for a 25-year storm as suggested in your uh, subdivision ordinance under the road construction uh, specifications. This ditching obviously uh, will impact the construction of the pathway when and if that is constructed in this area and uh, the s solution to that is that uh, or a proposed solution one proposed solution is to put in a shallow catch basin in this area and a small pipe section and capture the water along shore road in that catch basin direct it through a pipe onto the applicant's property and then through the culvert as we are proposing uh, to do with our ditch this uh, mechanism and, and the acceptance of public water under private property does uh, heed some legal uh, documents. And we have uh, an updated stormwater easement and conveyance uh, document. I, we just uh, got it from our lawyer today and, and put it to Maureen. We'll have it reviewed by the town lawyer. Uh, we, we did have a draft reviewed by the town lawyer. They suggested some changes. We made those changes and uh, expect that to be approved um, the next time the town lawyer has a chance to look at it. But th that conveyance and easement gives rights for the town to maintain that uh, structure, that, that system, so that stormwater uh, will always be able to, to take this path over the private property and through the culvert. So that um, if, you know, for some reason, 10 owners down the road, they don't like this culvert, uh, they can't just take it out. Uh, that the town is is an enforcement and, and a responsibility to this stormwater structure. Okay? Um, and it, that also allows the conveyance of the stormwater itself across private property. So we believe that issue is, uh, is taken care of. The access way design is a little bit different than the last time we talked to you. Last time we had a little straighter on. Uh, we had the hammerhead uh, in the opposite direction. In looking at impacts of this development on both, well, a lot of factors in, in construction costs and environmental and stormwater impacts. Uh, we decided to, to try and curve that, uh, make the road a little shorter, shorten up our pipe a little bit, and add the pervious pavement to it. And the, the pervious pavement itself is quite an addition to the construction costs, uh, but uh, shortening up the road and, and shortening up the pipes and stuff, we feel that you know, we've saved the client a little bit of money. But uh, he has, uh, or MC Associates has decided to, to, to put a little bit of a green element on this and, and offer up the, the porous pavement. And porous pavement is relatively new uh, to Maine and uh, New England, but uh, yeah, UNH uh, has, has a whole stormwater uh, division uh, that has really uh, studied this stuff, and Maine has adopted a lot of those findings in that research, and, and the, the most recent example of porous pavement that I've heard of and experienced is right in front of Main Mall and Main Mall Road. There's a four-lane highway that's, that goes right in front of Best Buy that's all porous pavement uh, from basically uh, what was uh, Twitter, I believe it was, or tweet, Twitter, um, up through, <laughs> through the main turnpike intersection. And uh, that might be an area that you you may want to look at as, as a board in where, future where, reference. Where are you proposing the uh, porous pavement? The porous pavement is this entire hash area. So, so essentially where you're showing it's being paved, will be paved. Everything in the private access way, within the private access way right of way, that's going to be pavement will be porous pavement. 
And you, you, your comment earlier was you added impervious material, but, but technically that's not impervious material. Well, that, right. That's the benefit of it in stormwater water. Well, I understand. I just try to understand what you said so I understand the record correctly. So you're not adding impervious material to, to the access way. Not in the access way. We have left the personal driveway and the building as if it were a traditional pavement and a traditional home. That will be up to the buyer as to whether they would like to extend that porous pavement up or do a moss roof or whatever they want, you know, or a multitude of other environmental limited impact development features, such as rain gardens, rain barrels, drip line, you know, dry soils, things like that. But we tried to be somewhat conservative and say, okay, we can do what we can do, and then the owner hopefully can do what they can do, um, but we don't want to limit the property that much in the saleability of it, is, is my client's view on it. So are you building out that, uh, imp that driveway before you sell it, or are you going to hand that to the buyer and say, this is the approval and part of the approval, if we approve it, well, we have the, imper the pervious porous paint? I, I believe that my client is looking to sell it relatively soon, and so the construction would be the responsibility of the new owner. Right. But that it would be an approved, enforceable action or, or condition. condition that it be built to the plans that you sure. guys have approved. Well, not, unless he comes back and asks for it. Right. Know. So and gets it. this porous pavement is, is it's four. Previously, we had two inches of just traditional pavement um, on, this, on this site. The porous pavement increases that cross-section to four inches of um, well-graded pavement that will accept flow of water now instead of just shedding it off. And then there's, um, there's more, I've, we have a cross section right here. This section, the first section underneath the car, and I believe, I don't know if I can zoom in on that anymore. Okay. The first layer, is a porous asphalt, it's four inches thick. The second layer is what's called a three-quarter inch stone choker porous, and uh, that can actually range from four inches to eight inches depending on, on the site. And keep in mind this is for a commercial parking lot that UNH installed on their facility. Okay? Uh, and then they put 24 inches of a sand slash gravel um, filter course, which is a bank run gravel that uh, has quite a bit of voids in it. And um, then it's, then they have taken a, a commercial look at this and they actually wanted to uh, almost permanently retain water on, on their site in, in lieu of a retention or detention pond. Okay? So they put in a 21 inch layer of crushed rock with some underdrain in it. And they sized that to take a 25 year storm. Okay? For a driveway, they suggest that you could actually limit it to just the eight inches of this uh, dark brown layer point here, of this layer right here, the number two layer, um, and have, have that as your filter uh, for just a driveway because it doesn't see a lot of traffic. What we've done is mimic, uh, we've tried to kind of balance the two. Taking the four inches of pavement, we put in eight, in, eight inches of the choker, and we put in, um, I believe it's eight inches of the uh, sand and gravel filter so that we have at least the 18 inches of sub-base that we would have normally, plus we have the four inches of pavement, okay? We do not have a crushed stone because um, it's just cost prohibitive to actually build a pond underneath the driveway, okay? And actually the depth of that it would be uh, kind of impossible for this site. So I wanted to be clear on that. Um, then I guess I did add a profile on the plan that you can see he here, excuse me, sorry, uh, and that shows that we have slopes of 2.67% 2, 2 right at the beginning, and then it goes to 1.2%, then we're just under 5%, and we end up at like 3.5%. So this whole driveway is under the 5%, which uh, the ordinance requires that we stay under 5% within, I think, 75 feet of the intersection. So uh, we have slight grades on the driveway itself. Um, 
We have added as well a culvert crossing the hammerhead, and this allows for the collection of stormwater from this area right here. So any water that comes from this high point down, it was kind of uh, in a no man's land. So we added, in talking with AMEC uh, Engineering, we, we decided to put a culvert across here and uh, establish a ditch on this side to get the water down uh, to the wetland. Okay. So now I guess I'll talk about the 600 pound gorilla in the room, which is obviously we've had uh, you know a, a number of, of letters uh, from concerned neighborhood neighbors, and we fully understand their concerns, and um, that's our concern with our stormwater design itself. And we feel that with the culvert and the porous pavement, that we have a complete stormwater design for this uh, facility, for this project, and that this has been sized to properly handle a 25-year storm which is what uh, we're regulated to, uh, to do. Uh, we're also regulated to look at peak flow rates and not necessarily the volume of water. But given the concerns of uh, the neighbors and, and apparent you know, structural damage in uh, the neighborhood from uh, previous storms and, uh, and other such rel uh, related things, you know, it was obvious that we needed to look at volume uh, on this site. And so as part of that situation, you know, the porous pavement came into the discussion. And in, you know, preparing our numbers and looking at the numbers, uh, we, we've got it so that we're within a half a percent of the, the pre-development numbers. We have an increase of almost a half a percent uh, from the pre-development volume of the site. And believe that that is... Uh, an adequate effort to limit the impacts of this property uh, on neighboring properties. That you know, it is it is a small increase. It's so small that we feel that you know it's almost within the accuracy of, of the program that we're using. Um, and and our peak rates are within a couple tenths of the pre-development flows as well. Um, and uh, believe that that is also a very insignificant. Uh, you know, feature in the stormwater. Obviously, we're taking out some woods, uh, we're adding porous pavement, we're adding some traditional pavement, and we're adding uh, a house. And, uh, you know, these things will add some volume, but we've tried to put green uh, features into the property that will limit that as much as possible. And we feel that our numbers show that we're not increasing the ponding elevation in this small area uh, here. And we're, not, we're keeping the flows the way they were as far as uh, rate, and we're keeping the flows uh, pretty much the way they were as far as volume. Yes? Is that calculation before the construction of the house and the possible driveway connector? No, that is including the, the entire development. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, that, that's why I mentioned before that we certainly included the house and the driveway. Mm -hmm. Uh, on our plan, and we put it in our model to be realistic about it, that this property is not just going to see a 160-foot driveway, it's going to see the private access way plus a private driveway plus a home. And with all of that on this property, we feel that uh, we, can, we can match the stormwater numbers that uh, we see in the pre-development uh, condition. And, uh, you know, our, our numbers are, the ponding elevation, even though we are taking out a, a few square feet of this uh, ponding area upstream of the culvert in our, with our driveway, we're still, our, our model is showing that we're still maintaining the same flooding elevation or ponding elevation, which is below the roadway uh, all the way through the 100-year storm. Uh, the, the board did ask me to look at larger storm, and I did do that. Uh, I put in a 500-year storm, which is 8.1 inches in a 24-hour period. And it showed in a rough model that um, it, it would flood Shore Road by uh, almost half a foot in the pre-development, you know, not looking at our development, mm -hmm. um, that in the pre-development condition, that the way the model is set up, that it would uh, flood the road by almost half a foot. Okay? And I believe we've seen storms like that over the last couple of years. And we have, I have not. I, I believe we have. 
seeing eight inches in a day. Uh, I know that. Patriots. Yeah, I don't know the exact inches of that. I, I do know that just this year in, in North Berwick, we saw two storms that were over eight inches in 24 hours. So, I mean, I don't know if that correlates to, to this exact location. But. And did your model, did you run the same model after post pre development, post development? Um, I, I did. The way the, mo the model made some assumptions because it was flooding so much that it, it really threw it way off. Um, I would have had to model a, a big pond, and so, so I, I just left it as even in the pre development condition, this thing's flooding over Six half a foot. About a half a foot over the road. Okay. And, uh, you know, that, that's a 500 year condition. And, uh, you know, obviously our. Our site would not help that situation. I, I don't think it would increase it either. But I, well, I, I guess that's the, that's the important point. Is it's, yeah. it's not going to make it any worse. No, no. It, such fact, extreme... I mean, if it's if it's flooding Shore Road, it's going to be flooding this private access way, and there would be no restriction uh, of flow by the driveway to that culvert. Yeah. So, uh, so the board asked me to look at that, and uh, I have those numbers you know, in the. I can put it up on the screen if you'd like. Um, but uh, so, and I, I will say that I apologize for the last meeting. Uh, we asked, the board asked me what the volume difference was, and I apparently went from a 25 year storm in the post development condition to a 10 year storm in the pre development condition. And we quickly calculated that it was a, like a 30% difference. And uh, it, it wasn't even close to that. It was, we were, we're at half a percent increase. Okay. So, I went from three something down to two something, and that was my error. It was it was three to three. It, you know, it's it's three point oh eight six acre feet in the pre development condition compared to three point one oh one in the post development condition, which is point oh one five feet, acre feet, which is half a percent of the total. Okay. So, quick question about that: Is that volume calculation dependent on how heavy a storm it is, or is that constant? It, twenty-five year storm. No, it changes. It storm? changes slightly throughout the model, but I, that's the twenty-five year storm. Which is in the ordinance. Which is in the ordinance, and which is you know we consider the worst case. Um, I think it fluctuated, you know, between maybe 046 percent to four point to point four eight percent. You know, it mm -hmm. it's. Uh, it, it does fluctuate, but the percentage increased in that, I, I would say. You all, you all set? I think so. You've done your presentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I just want a quick comment. If anyone's interested in that porous pavement, there is a strip of it uh, on the access to Spurwink River on the Scarborough side of the Spurwink um, down to the no, kayak no, landing. I mean, uh, when the people drive off the road and down into the... Well, you, you can launch your kayak in the little yeah. deck is there for observation. That, that Scarborough, when it, when it, uh, when it tarred it, put in the porous, the same porous asphalt that the developer is proposing. Yeah. So if you're interested in looking at it, it's kind of fascinating stuff. It, it, it minimizes the, uh, uh, the runoff right into the spurring from cars that park to launch their boats there. Barbara? Just one quick question. Um, <clears throat> So we can maybe ahead of time clarify any questions. The, the porous material will apparently accommodate heavy um, equipment. Is that correct? Heavy equipment? For example, a truck that might go on it. Or yes. Yeah. It, so even though it's porous, it's very sturdy. It's very sturdy. And, and we're actually putting a thicker layer of pavement than we would have with the traditional. Uh, so yes, we feel, and, and it's got even more of a sub base than the other. So it will actually handle probably more weight than than the other driveway we were proposing. Because it's kind of hard to get your head around the fact that you know something's porous but it's still well, stable, it, like, but it is. Yeah, all, all they've done is taken some of the sand out of the mix. They've created small voids in the pavement that you you can't see by looking at it. Uh, it's just. But it allows the water. But to allows see the water to see through. It doesn't automatically just sheet off. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Sure. One question. Um, a lot of what you're saying, and a lot of our consideration, has to do with the accuracy of the modeling that you're talking about, which is obviously very complex because it seems that small differences that you make 
can make small input differences can make significant output differences. And as I'm looking at the various letters we have from our town engineer, I'm not clear whether we have independent confirmation of the validity of that modeling, particularly the validity of it now that we're talking about forest pavement. Can you enlighten me, Maureen? Um, the plans that you get usually aren't quite as thick as the plans that I get and the town engineer gets because included in those plans and are pages and pages and pages of calculations. And what the board has decided a long time ago was that you don't look at the individual calculations. And so a copy of this goes to me for the public file, and a copy goes to the town engineer. And they actually do review the calculations. So if I believe if the applicant was using a model that the engineer wasn't comfortable with or he didn't think accurately reflected uh, the situation, he would have made that comment in his letter. In fact, I, I don't remember the project, but there was a project at some point where um, the engineer suggested that it was an inappropriate model they were using. It was much better for watersheds and larger projects and suggested they switch to a different model. So I'm confident that the town engineer is looking at calculations and is checking the model. Even though the town engineer suggests one of the questions I had, had some suggestions for revising the analysis based on some questions that are raised. And since I can't pretend to understand that model, I don't know if any of those revisions of the analysis could take us from one half of a percent difference to one and a half percent difference or the other way. If, are we talking about the letter from the, the most town engineer the June 10 June letter, 10. And paragraph nine. OK, thank you. Okay, so his comments are, are a reference to Oxford County again, um, that seems not which is pretty basic. Um, particularly paragraph B, with, since the whole porous pavement idea is a new concept, it wasn't clear to me that the town engineer had re-looked at the model, taking into account the porous pavement. I think that I think the, the comments from the town attorney town engineer on paragraph B is basically stating that the porous pavement will reduce the runoff that's leaving the site. That's how I read it too. Right. I just wanted to be clear that we that, that we feel independently confident on, the, on about the data that we're getting. Reasonably so. I feel confident. Okay. I, don't I, I thought the town engineer was clear that he didn't feel that um, that this should help and not hinder it in any way. Help enough to get us down to 0.5 or 0.48 percent. Well, he says we'll help. We'll act to attenuate the modest increase. Half a percent is a modest increase. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think the okay. town the town engineer is suggesting that without the course pavement there are problems with this that he would have to identify as a, as a stormwater situation. I think he's saying that there's not a lot of increased period. Um, and then you add the porous pavement option, it further addresses something. I mean, the, the board's kind of in a tough spot here where you, you do have standards based, you know, your stormwater ordinance. And I don't think the town engineer is saying that those standards haven't been met. He's not saying. He's not saying that. Yeah. And then in addition, the applicant is now offering and this more course pavement option. So I just want to say, Elaine, I agree. And I feel like we are taking the models on faith. Um, I did take this comment to mean that the town engineer had reviewed it. But I, was, I did want to ask the applicant about um, switching the county that you used in your model to Cumberland County from Oxford County. I think that was an issue. Um, when we looked at completeness also. Yes, and um, the, the numbers in the, in the model and in the Stonewall report reflect the Cumberland County. I just didn't change the text in the gotcha. sentence that says Oxford County. Okay, I great. apologize for that. Yeah, but um, intuitively for me, it's um, difficult to understand how if 
um, when covering about a third of the lot with impervious surface, how the um, runoff can only increase half a percent. And I think it would be interesting for the public to understand it as well as us, how that's possible. Just in layman's terms, is that? Well, oh, that's a fair question. He gives a good explanation in that, the one handout um, that uh, I think he should, had it on the, the, the Teradyne letter. It it's the uh, June 7th Teradyne letterhead that, that he actually flashed it up there. It's got this car on it. Oh. It tells you how it works right there. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the course pavement. The pavement. Right, but that actually didn't change the assumptions in your model much. I, I think no, no. About the numbers that you inputted, and they weren't went from 77. Went from 98, which is is a, a number that basically says that 98 percent of the water will be shed from that surface. Right. And I put it back to what it was as a forest and D soils, uh, which are very um, unaccepting soils of water, uh, so that 77 percent of that water would be shed off. Mm -hmm. So it's not. An exact, you know, takeaway of impervious area, but it, it basically it more mimics the timing that it would in a in a wooded area. Um, and actually, I took no effort to um, hide any volume or take credit for any volume decreases by this porous pavement. Okay, uh, the only volume decrease would be a coincidence with the 77 number compared to the 98 number. Okay, that there was no um, other attenuation of volume within the calculations. Okay, um, and, and I thought that was rather conservative uh, approach, but I wanted to be conservative on, on the study. Um, this is the watershed map. It's relatively crude, but this is the pre-development. We are talking about this entire area is about 13 acres, uh, 12 and a half acres, okay, that, that's highlighted as, as uh, 1S and 2S. The property is located in this area, okay. So we're talking about 33,000 square feet, which is less than an acre. Wouldn't it be on the other side? No. That's your road. I think this is helpful. Yeah, the lot down here, right. Okay. Yeah, Shore Road runs. You were showing a lot up in Delano Park, I thought. Well, that label of Delano Park is, is from a USGS map. It's, it's incorrect. Delano Park is actually south of Shore Road. Um, and this is our property right in this area that we're talking oh, okay. about. Okay. Okay. So, so we're talking about a 33,000 square foot lot within a 13 acre watershed. Gotcha. And that's the so simplest. Already, so a lot of the water from the 13 acre watershed is flowing over the lot. Yes. So what you do on the, the, the lot itself, which is on the downstream end of the watershed. Yes. And the, the lot is, is very close to the culvert. Mm -hmm. and, and more importantly, our impervious area is very close to the, to the culvert. Mm -hmm. okay, so it doesn't take very much time at all for the entire water, the entire volume of runoff and in, in its peak flow rate of speed um, for the entire development to reach that culvert compared to uh, a path from this A, B, all the way down. I um, wish I could highlight that better, but this path through here, okay? So that's, it's, it's a timing issue, and uh, I can go to the next map. So you can see that this is our lot. We're actually only, we're taking half of the lot and putting it on the east side of the culvert. So that's, that's getting to the culvert without even going through our proposed 15-inch uh, culvert. And then the rest of the watershed is coming down and is getting accepted by our 15-inch culvert and being distributed to the 24-inch culvert. So in your modeling, you are modeling the entire watershed? Yes. Gotcha. That was very yeah. helpful. OK. I'm sorry. We still have a public hearing, and that's fine. The board can ask but, all their questions. But you questions. know, I think this discussion is important to have I'm a, a, before I'm completely the in favor of it. Okay. Um, now, the water that's going to collect in that culvert, the concern of the people on the other side is that some of that water is going through the culvert and somehow or other landing on their property. Now, is that 
I mean, that's going from the culvert into a pipe, isn't it? That's going out to the ocean. Well, there's two culverts, Barbara, right? But go ahead. They're, they're you're talking about, are you talking about the 24-inch one or the one they're proposing? I'm talking about, in? well, we have the 15-inch culvert that's going to go back onto the land on the lot, isn't it? They're in, and they're installing that. Yeah. Yeah, right. that you're installing is going to contain the water on the lot itself. Well, it, it, it's, it's going to allow water to flow through our property in a similar fashion as it does today. But it's, it's not going to uh, collect any water on the site. It's not going to act as a, a pond. Is it going to take it to the 24-inch yes. culvert? Yes, yes. And that 24-inch culvert, which isn't yours, right. has nothing to do with you, but that 24-inch culvert, is there a pipe that goes from that 24-inch culvert to the ocean? Or does it dump it somewhere else? As I understand, it flows over land for, for a distance, and uh, I'm not sure what happens after that. From, uh, I only know from the letters. Um, so that 24-inch culvert is dumping into somebody's property, supposedly? Yes. On the other side? Yes. Okay. That has nothing to do with you. You've got to contain the water on your site. And right. We're, sure. we're limited to our property line, which is contiguous with a ponding of the inlet side of the culvert. Does that make sense? How uh, much... Under the existing conditions. It, that's what's there now. Right, right. And yeah, under... we're, we're matching You're not those. causing that. That's... So right. it, that's there's the going to be no increase except for half a percent in, in the water. amount of water that's going to reach that 24-inch culvert after development than there is prior to development, according yes. to the models and the agreement of Bob Malley, the town engineer. Right. And, and remember... The controls they're putting in. To that. And the controls, yeah. Yeah. The impervious surface. Yeah. And, and I just want to remind you... The extra culvert. The regulations and what we're reviewing is not the volume. It's the peak rate of flow. Right. Which we show to be right on with the pre-development, you know, within 0.2 uh, CFS of the pre-development. I just want to be clear that I understand it and hope that maybe... Mm -hmm. So, as I understand, and just correct me if I'm wrong, the, the half a percent increase is total volume, which is actually slightly separate from what the ordinance requires. Yes. In terms of uh, what should be the standard for approval, which is peak rate flow. Right, right. And, and you know, it, you have to go through a couple different sections of your ordinance to actually get to, the, to what is potentially your regulated stormwater flow because in, you know you have just a little sentence in the in the private access way standard that says that you have to show that you're the storm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know we've obviously recognized that we need to meet your ordinance wherever that paragraph may be um, to peak flow rates and that we design our infrastructure to to safely pass the 25 year storm in that we analyze the 100-year storm for the, RP, uh, the resource protection permit and um, that the applicant has decided to go above and beyond that you know, with additional cost of construction to put in forest pavement and all of the sub-base that goes along with that in an effort to decrease the total stormwater impact on the culvert and therefore the impact on downstream properties. Okay. Okay. You, all, you all set? I'm all set. Any, any other board member have any other questions? Maureen, is there anyone to add at this point? Okay. Uh, then what I'd like to do is uh, open the public hearing and invite anyone wishing to speak concerning the applicant's proposal to step up to the microphone, introduce yourself, and make your comments. That's it. The mic is actually behind the podium. You can see it in front of you, ma'am, the black. So if you could speak toward that, uh, we'll get it on the air and we'll be able to hear it a little bit okay. better. Um, I'm Martha Hopes. I'm one of the owners at 509 Delano Park, um, and I'm the one who wrote uh, one of the letters. Um, I had a couple questions um, about the porous pavement. You said that um, you were um, skipping some of the sublayer sections and going with the what you described as number two, the dark layer. Um, and as I understand it, the way porous pavement works, um, 
you take out some of the sand, which does actually decrease some of the rigidity and does actually make it so that the pavement is not actually quite as stable, just to answer one of the previous questions. Um, and, and then that allows water to flow through, but it has to flow through to somewhere. And it only actually decreases water flow if the water actually flows in somewhere and can enter the water table. Right? And so part of the point of the UNH system, where they had the crushed rock, et cetera, beneath, was to create a pool system that that water would go into to allow it to then get into the groundwater. So if you're skipping that step, it seems as though all you're doing is creating a bigger foam layer that then allows the water to sheet. I'm just, just having work. trouble hearing you when you talk. Can I turn to him? So if, I don't know how else to do it. Maybe if you step back and sort of uh, talk to everybody. And I, I, do you need me to repeat it? No, no, just the very last sentence I didn't catch. So if you could repeat that, that I would find that helpful. I think that um, I, I'm confused. I, I guess I was turning to him because I want him to answer this question for me. I'm confused about how um, taking out the sub-layers um, creates anything that really allows the water to enter the ground water table. Sure. Um, so that's the first question. And then the second one is, um, from my understanding of uh, the zoning ordinances, um, it does seem as though there are some uh, regulations around actually increasing, even though it's only by half a percent, depending on how you run the models. Um, and given that you said 30 percent potentially before, now you're saying half a percent. I'm having a, a slight issue with your comfort with the models. Um, so. There, the, I believe the zoning regulations do say that you are not supposed to actually increase water flow onto other properties, and it sounds as though this will, which I think is something of a problem. Um, I, it does seem as though maybe the town could set something up so that the water doesn't actually go onto other properties, and that that would then make it fine to pass something like this. I'm sorry, the last sentence, make it what? Fine. Fine to pass something like this? If the town could make sure that the water wasn't going to go onto other people's property, that would seem reasonable. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the removal of wetland does remove sort of a, um, something that's sort of like a sponge for the land. Um, so although we can get wetland areas where you have um, a standing water table, so you have water that's actually standing up above, slightly above the surface in sort of a ponding situation. You can also get wetland that leads to um, a spongy sublayer, and that increases the absorption of water by the land. And so, um, although you, uh, in your models, describe this soil as a fairly impervious soil type, if you have wetland areas on there, um, that's maybe not a very accurate uh, difference between pre-development and post-development. If you have wetland on there, even if you only have a single parking space amount of wetland, you nonetheless have a sponge that you're removing. Um, and it's a sponge that allows water to head down into the water table as opposed to into our land. Um, so those are, those are at least my initial questions and comments. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishes to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Laverty. I'm the president of the Delano Park Association. I live at 303 Delano Park. Um, we have several issues with this um, building out and water flow. Uh, I think one of the issues that is being glossed over is the um, where this is located on Shore Road. If you and I believe, if I read the minute, uh, all the details correctly, I've been here a couple of days, reading all the things that there was never a site visit by the board because it was too wet out or too raining out? No, no that's that not incorrect? true. Okay. We, we walked the well, site when we walked the Shore Road Path site. Okay. Fortunately, it was literally right along the road. Right. And, and we, we were, met the were you walking the Shore Road Path site for Shore Road Path? Were you walking this that, site for That this date, center? we did both. We walked okay. the Shore Path to there, and, then, and the record should be clear on this. Then we okay. met the applicant and anyone that wished to show up because it was publicly noticed. 
um, at the site and those of us that wanted to could walk into the site as far as we needed to. And then, frankly, we finished this review and continued on with the Shore Road Path review. Uh, the issue is that that roadway, access way, will be virtually at the near the bottom of that road coming down. And either side, it comes from hills. I live on entrance three, and all I know is that's less than 250 feet from where that road's going to come in. So that's 250 feet is 80 yards. So you're saying it's less than 250 feet I, I, at, I believe at, it is at, at entrance three? He's talking about 250 feet for a site um, of road. The problem with some of the roadways there on entrance three, entrance four, and entrance five is specifically because they're all in that area. On my entrance three, which is the top of a road, I can see down the hill towards that property, but I can't see too well on the other hill. So I have to take very precautious measures to come out when I'm going left towards, towards here, towards the town, or south on the road. Okay? And Delano Park is on the east side of the road, not the south side of the road, and your driveway is going west, not north. But um, the, the problem there is we think that there are going to be um, more issues of cars and accidents because the same happens on entrance four, that they can't see to the right or to the north up the hill because the cars are coming over that hill. That hill is, has a short distance and then comes down. So they have to be very careful. And the same on entrance five coming the other way from the south end, that, that hill comes up. So we think this is going to add another element of danger on that road. Um, and it's dangerous now. People do not drive 30 miles an hour on that road. Uh, and that is one of the issues. We think the bigger issue is the water problem. Um, waterway already spills into um, Martha Hoops' uh, and her family's. Uh, that is mostly their, their lawn, their, their, their property. And the culvert thing goes through. I walked it all the other, last weekend after the rainstorm. Um, and it flows all the way through there, touches the back of another property, comes out underneath the, the Raspa um, Staples property, has hurt theirs, and eventually 880 feet, I think, by their designation, flows down to the ocean. There's nothing left by the time it gets down to the ocean because it has flooded her property and therefore has a, a lot of trees that have come down because of the wetness of the property and the, and the high winds and the storms that we have had. And one in 25 years is, I believe, a little ridiculous in New England, but that's another story. The, the, um, the problem with all that is you're, you're pounding more, more water on someone's property. And intuitively, I think you were talking about this, intuitively, if you take that whole watershed and let it go down on, if you use this as the whole watershed there, and have it go come down here all the way through so it has time to go through what is porous land and, and everything that there, some of it and a lot, well, you know, a lot of it, not all of it obviously, it probably a decent amount goes into the water table. I'm not an ecologist. I don't know, and there is pooling down below. If you take a drainage system and run a culvert across underneath there to gather a lot of water the way they plan it, a figure like this, if you tell me that if I pour the same amount of water down there as I would if I drip the same amount of water across here, if you tell me the water is not going to flow through that drainage pipe down into the 24 inch culvert at a faster pace with more force to go across the road and yet again flood more of the property across the road. Um, I, you really have to think about that again. I think that's, that's highly improbable that there's only 0.05 or one quarter inch, whatever the statement was, that more, more water to flow through at, hard, at higher times. It's just highly improbable that they're gathering water through a culvert, that that water is not going to come down with a greater force at one time and load into the the 24 inch culvert that goes underneath the road. Um, so we think that that is, is not fitted into the model correctly. And I'm in the financial business, I'm not in the building business, I'm not an engineer, not a soil tester, but the last time I heard models that worked were in 07 when the financial district blew up because of their models from every MIT engineer and math major that there is in the world. 
And that's how good models are. They can't compute everything. They don't think of everything. They can run all these tests, but it's never really been tested. They run it through a model. And if you're telling me that an eight-inch eight inch rainstorm in 24 hours isn't going to run through there faster because of those pipes, and their models say it isn't true, I'm a very big disbeliever, and I, I really don't think that's really going to be the case. And it's going to cause more problems on our side of the road. And it's not just going to cause the whoops Brill family. It's going to cause three or four other people problems on the, on the other side of the road due to flooding. I have a question, though. Do those, the problems you're talking about, do those exist now? Yes, what? they do. Okay. Yes, they do. The, the, this runs down, and then there's the um, uh, Dallas Levy property that's adjoining her property across the road down the bottom. It is the um, Raspa and Staples property, and then it is the um, Pride property that, that adjoins that as the, we have paper roads in there that that stream continues on and goes down through the paper road between into what we call the South Park Marsh and then eventually in a culvert and goes down to the ocean if there's heavy enough water. I've never really seen it get down that far because it floods way, down, way beyond that. But it has seriously impacted uh, the Staples um, Rasper property, where they've had it put up in the building, and they're going to have to build a culvert underneath all that, uh, uh, underneath uh, road number four that loops around their property, and I think can seriously impact, if there's, a, if there's more water to go through there, seriously impact all the way down to the Marshall property, which is actually on the water. Um, and I do know that the Heather, the, um, the Dallas Levy property just put in a new septic that is, when I walked it, even after not heavy rains last weekend, that was flooded right up to that septic. That's going to make that septic not perform. And that is built up septic to about this high up the ground because they are on another unconforming lot that is 40 feet by 100 feet that the state and the town permitted that septic to be built. And so that is raised up four feet behind this little garage apartment house that has going to cause them a lot of problems with their septic system going forward too. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak? Could, could you just wait just a second? And the only yes, but I, what I like to do is get everyone up here once, okay. and if, if you want to make an additional comment, that's fine. Is there anyone else that wants to speak concerning the application before I have Swoops come up again? Go ahead. I think that's just fair, and at some point. Where is the microphone? It's again? right on the, on the right here. That's the mic. Oh, that. You talk toward okay. that. You know, Thank you very much. Gentlemen in the booth, we'll pick you uh, up. My name is Ma uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Ms. O'Mara. Um, my name is Marion Guthrie, and I live at 108 Delano Park. I am not in a butter to this. I live on the other side of the park. But I've been listening to all of this. I wrote you uh, a, a rather lengthy memo last week asking what, were, uh, what was this um, PVC pipe that is superimposed into the, uh, the, the offending culvert. Um, I had never seen a PCV pipe. It's coming from the ground. And perhaps this gentleman could answer that question, or since you went on a site walk, maybe you saw it. But I, I wondered what was its purpose? And I think that we need to answer that question. And then the second question that I had about this culvert, which I feel should be uh, totally plugged, um, the second question I had was, um, what is going to happen to that culvert, which is in a gully, if the pathway uh, becomes a reality? If the pathway becomes a reality, I think you're going to have to fill because you wouldn't have the path go down into a gully. So if you fill the culvert that is on that westerly side is going to be covered. Now, are you going to extend that culvert if it is covered by the pathway? And that was my second question. So I hope that the culvert 
if the pathway becomes a reality, is never, ever extended because the culvert that we are talking about is causing terrible damage to um, private property. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning? Good evening. My name is Dale Morrow. I live at uh, 4 Ironclad Road, which is the property on Shore Road that runs from Delano 5 to Ironclad. And I just simply want to reinforce some of the statements that have already been made. Uh, we have experience with the existing conditions, a uh, severe saturation, especially this spring. Um, I realized conditions were a little unusual. I lost a 40-foot pine, about 15, uh, I'm sorry, a 40-inch pine diameter, about 100-foot diameter. I went across Shore Road. It was a wonderful experience for everyone, I'm sure. But the, uh, that was about uh, 30 feet from Delano 5, and it was a direct result of saturation. Uh, this spring. Uh, when the windstorm came up, there was simply nothing to hold the root structure of the tree. Obviously, it had been there for at least 100 years. So it is something to do with conditions that have uh, come about recently. Uh, I have seen more substantial pooling uh, on that section of my property uh, during rainstorms. And I realized that the you know, design uh, while may accommodate some of these things, the situation is, is that any increase in water flow is simply unacceptable because it's going to impact not only the drainage on my side of Iron Flat, of uh, Delano Fox, but also the Brill Hoops property on the other side. Um, frankly, my biggest concern is I've attended all three planning board meetings that uh, this presentation has been made, and I've heard so many errors presented by the company themselves, I realize that as they refine this, but I've heard differences in percentages presented, uh, variances in designs, and I realize this latest one has been reviewed by the town engineer, but frankly I'm concerned that uh, even he's admitted an error in typos in that identifying whether or not this was an Oxford County or Cumberland County model. So there have just been so many variables that I really don't know what to believe. So it's something that uh, should it proceed, I would strongly recommend that uh, an, an additional outside consultant be used to verify whatever he's talking about because I really don't have any credibility on what he's been presenting. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? You're up. Thank you. Martha Hoops again, 509, Del 509 Delano Park. Um, I just wanted to build on what Mr. Laverty said. I think that you asked, are those problems current? And I think he heard, are those properties current? Which is why he outlined which properties they were. Um, the problems that we have been having with saturation, as just mentioned, um, are fairly new. And um, I think you say new? What, last year, last five years, last ten years? Well, if you look at the trees that are there, these are uh, trees that have grown up over the last 70 years. Mm. Um, and they have survived through that time. But on our property alone, about 20 came down in this past year. And we admittedly did lose about four the year before and about five the year before that. So admittedly, we have you know, a wooded lot. But we are looking at an area that um, had upland hardwoods and pines, but that has now become a very, very wet, saturated area that can't support these sorts of trees. So that's a, a fairly recent shift, and it is a shift that has happened over my lifetime. Um, my grandmother owned the property before my mother owned the property and before I now own it with my sisters and my cousin. And um, unfortunately, all I can say is that I know the shift is since my teenage years, but those were a while ago, and I can't get more specific than that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. But is there, is there some block that's keeping what used to drain out? Yeah, so um, Shore Road was moved. Okay. And, and in the movement of Shore Road, new culverts were set up. And with the new culverts, we have new water coming in. And with the new water coming in, we've had a change in the water table. When was Shore Road moved? Uh, sometime after I was a teenager. <laughs> 
which was which was quite a while. <laughs> Actually, I believe my, my I, I believe my grandmother was still alive, so I believe that that means it was before I was a teenager, and that it was in the 80s, in the early 80s would be my guess. But I'm sure you guys have records of when Shore Road was built. I, I've been here 10 years, and I don't remember it. Yeah, it, it was it, it was, was it was more ago. than 10 years ago for sure. I I I was a teenager more than 10 years ago for sure. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Anyone else wishing to speak? Second last call. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? Public hearing is open. Last call. Hearing none. To close the public hearing and invite the applicant up to the podium to maybe address some of the concerns that have been voiced by the abutters and other interested folks. And possibly the town planner will help us out as well. But go, go, go ahead, John. Okay. Um, I just was to start from the beginning. Uh, the UNH design of that porous pavement was for a commercial parking lot. Right. And as I mentioned in the, my presentation, they recommended that driveways that take uh, low traffic numbers could actually be reduced to just an eight inch layer of the, uh, what they entitle it, of the, This layer here was the choker course, stone choker course, number two. And we went even further than that. We put in an eight inch choker course and we put in an eight inch sand gravel filter course so that the water will percolate through the pavement, percolate through the choker course, and percolate through the sand filter course. Can I ask okay. a question? I'm sure. looking at the plans we have in front of us. They show a four inch choker course. Oh, excuse me. Have those plans been changed? The plan is stamped June 8th. Yep, you're right. Four inch choker course, eight inch filter course, and a three inch filter bit blanket. Right. Excuse so, what, what is, what in fact are you planning to do here? What's in that detail? Which is? So this is correct. It's four inch porous pavement, four inch choker, and eight inch filter. And a three inch, uh, and three inch filter blanket. Filter blanket. So, so what is it that the UNH stay said be reduced? recommended four inches of porous asphalt, and then you could just leave it at an eight inch choker course, and that would be it. But you're only for a drive. Yeah. They're adding another layer. But we're adding 11 more inches of material okay. on top of that, or below that. Below that. So they're reducing, essentially, the middle layer. UNH recommends the first two of that model, John. Do I have that right? What's that? UNH recommends you can use just one and two. One, one and a thicker layer of two, yes. Okay, double, double the double layer, layer of two. Double the layer of two, yep. You're saying, no, we're going to do four inches layer two and add... How many inches? Eight We're doing inches of eight inches of number three. Sand filter. Yep. And then, and then three inch. Three inches of, of uh, a, a coarser right. gravel underneath that. So that represents a full sub base to your private road sandings, basically. And that will that will offer the support for the roadway. Okay. Um, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, misnaming the thicknesses. Uh, so, and, and also in my presentation, I, I mentioned that we, we took no retention of volume uh, assumptions in our porous pavement. That all we did was reduce the curve number down um, to a, the same number that the woods um, represent. Okay? So we, we did not uh, include any storage of volume under this roadway. And that basically the, the advantage of this system is that it slows the water dramatically uh, so that it, it doesn't uh, coincide with the other flows, uh, the other higher flows, and um, actually reduces the, uh, well, the, 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 basically the responsibility of the, uh, of the culvert itself to, to take on water. Okay. So, we don't need this, this crushed stone layer on a private driveway because we're not assuming uh, volume storage, okay? And that 
the actual treatment of water is the trickling through these different layers that we're talking about in that there is a chance um, I know Ms. Hoops mentioned uh, seepage in the groundwater. We, um, we didn't take it into account. Uh, but the, seven, the curve number of 77 takes into account a little bit of um, pit and mile. Well, it, it takes into account some, some topography in a wooded area. And so the delay of runoff from this forest pavement best is, is best represented as that delay in the, the same delay that woods would re represent. We're not saying that this is all going to go into the groundwater and disappear. Okay? We have conservatively said that we're not, we haven't taken any calculations that say that we're reducing the volume by this porous paper. Okay? So I, I don't want it to come across like we're saying that you know, we're reducing all this volume by this, this porous paper. It's, it's basically a peak flow um, event. It slows it down tremendously. It treats it as it goes through, and there's a chance that it's going to percolate through these many inches of sands and gravels, come out the side of the sub-base, and enter the drainage system. Okay, just so that's understood. There, the only chance for groundwater, uh, I believe, um, interception of this is in the cut area of the profile, which is up near the, you know, up in this section of the road. The other section is, is uh, over two feet of fill, so I don't believe that uh, we'll, you know, we'll be getting into groundwater with that, uh, with that section. Say that again? Okay. I didn't. The, the only way that this sub-base is going to directly contribute to groundwater is in the, in the cut I see. section of our profile. Okay. Um, and uh, general comments about, about the model itself. We used um, a HydroCAD model, which is based on TR55, which is something that was, um, it's been around for, for ages. Um, I don't know exactly how long, but it's, it's the industry standard in engineering. It's been reviewed by AMEC engineers. Um, I actually gave a copy to, to Bob Metcalf as well. I haven't heard anything back from him. From who? Uh, uh, Bob Metcalf of Mitchell Associates. Oh, yes. uh, it was reported to us that, that he was interested in reviewing this um, from a couple of the neighbors in Delano Park. So we uh, gave him all of our stuff and said uh, to review it. And uh, that we would be welcome to any uh, improvements he, he may suggest. Um, so the, the model is, is, a, is a standard and uh, I believe I spent 13 years using it, learning it, and uh, the errors in reading the volumes just shows that I don't deal with volumes <laughs> very much on that model. Uh, I've, I've I guess say, this, my take on this whole thing, trying to simplify it and, and get out of the minutia okay. of the of this poor surface. Whether you don't do, if you don't do anything, we've got a problem. All right, mm -hmm. of the water there. So I know Bob Malley's in the audience, and I remember reading a letter, I don't have it in front of me, but 1989, I think, Bob, you said uh, you did some work on the culvert. Um, so I guess we're not addressing the problem. We're, I think whatever increase there is any with this porous pavement is so minor as to I ignore it. We're not addressing the problem. So I don't know if Bob, can you... Do you, are you prepared to talk or shed any light on, on this? I don't think Bob is here. Oh, he's here. Oh, he's here. Oh, there he is. Oh, Bob Malley. Not to put you on the spot, Bob. Sorry about that. But. That's all right. Just in fairness to Jim, I was going to ask him anyway. But why don't we have the developer just finish his responses, okay. and then I, I am going to invite Bob to come up and sort of review the, the email that he responded to the letter that we got, which was at my request. Um, and to maybe offer some suggestions for the future. But why don't you respond to your points okay. um, uh, that you had to what the abutters and neighbors are, are saying. Okay, the next general subject was uh, site distance. Uh, I, I think we've, we've covered that. Another uh, traffic engineer has looked at that. We have a note on the plans that says that once this is blasted, uh, he, he or uh, another 
professional engineer needs to go on the site and actually measure the distances again and make sure that the blasting has succeeded uh, in getting us the 250 feet or more of stopping site distance. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the, there was mention of the 8-inch storm. The 8-inch storm was as a request to you guys um, to, to say, you know, does this area have a problem in, in a big storm? And, you know, that lends itself to the model itself. Um, the model says that the road floods at, you know, almost six inches, of, that the road, shore road would flood at six inches in an eight inch storm. And I don't know if that happened or not. It may not have happened. Um, these models do tend to be pretty conservative. Uh, the PVC pipe, and I believe that's mentioned in, in the uh, letter that you're talking about from the public works director, someone that, my understanding is that's a foundation drain, a perimeter drain, it's a four to six inch PVC pipe. Those pipes traditionally do not add significant flow to anything. Uh, I looked in an old 1970s uh, USDA manual and, and they suggest that soils like this would, um, would uh, introduce, like, uh, I think it was a, a .05 CFS per thousand feet of pipe to the system. So this is very small. In a 25 year storm we're talking about 23 CFS. On this site, you add 0.05 CFS to it in, in a foundation drain. It's just not not in the same realm. Okay, um, and uh, you know the pathway. It's my understanding that this that's, been, that's not your responsibility. Okay. Uh, we will and, have that later, though. Yeah, I mean, and, and talk about that. You know, the, that these stormwater problems do seem to be before we get to this area, and, and I believe that we're doing our best to. You know, okay. lessen our impact. That's fine. Question for, just for the record, since you've looked at the 13 acre watershed, are there any subdivisions in that watershed? Like, for example, is the Cranbrook neighborhood no. in that? No. no? Okay. The, the only thing in that watershed is, is the, the conservation woods mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the very back of, a, of one of the lots in um, the Dyer Pond subdivision that's wooded mm -hmm. and the single family home of. Um, is it Canal? Mr. Canal. Mr. Canal. And that's a, a heavily wooded site as well that's, um, that's already developed. So Thanks. there's no chance of development outside of this property within that watershed. When Bob Malley gets up here, I think this problem is a lot. I mean, I don't think this applicant is creating the problem. I right. think the problem exists and that the town really needs to take a look at what's going on here. And I'd like to hear, Bob, when you get up here, some response to that. I know we have your letter, but obviously, I'd also like to say that this year was very difficult. It wasn't only Delano Park that got hit. This whole town got blown to smithereens this year. And it had nothing to do with any pipes anywhere. We just got a tremendous amount of water. Whether this will continue or not, we don't know. I mean, the weather patterns are changing. And, but I think that we've got a real problem here that this was sort of Pandora's box being opened and you kind of got caught in it and are trying to solve the problems on your parcel of land. But the problems are greater than that. The problems are what's going on around the land that has nothing to do with your putting one house on this. I think. Barbara, I, think I, just, I want to shepherd the meeting along, and, and if there's no other particular questions for the applicant, I'd like to excuse him from the podium. Uh, I, I would echo what you're saying, though. I'm not sure from what I've seen at all that this particular proposal is incrementally adding anything to the existing problem. Bob, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bob Malley, Public Works Director, for those of you who don't know me. Um, just a couple of responses. You know, I want to just echo what Barbara said. We have seen an increase in what I call catastrophic rain events. And over the last 10 years, we seem to be getting more calls. You know, Bob, I've got water that I've never had before. And if you look at the pattern of rain events, we had just this past year, for example, we had 15 inches of rain between January, February, and March. And the storm on the 24th and 25th of February. I believe hit over nine inches, so you know, that sort of exasperates the saturation issues that we have. Um, but going back to the culvert, the culvert was you know, replaced in 1989. It was a traditional corrugated metal pipe culvert. And we replaced you know, with, with a, a, a PVC 
uh, variety. Just again, thinking of long-term uh, durability and longevity with the PVC over the culverts, which traditionally the bottom rusts out on them. Uh, but I'm not aware of at least documented of downstream water problems. I can respect what the folks are saying about the issues, but we haven't been contacted, at least in this area, in this downstream watershed of, of issues and problems. So uh, some of this is new, but again, I go back to just the pattern of events that we're getting, and it really goes back to the storms of, you know, 98 and, and what have you, that with this, we're just seeing an increase in rain events where we get three inches of rain in a 24 hour period. We can't seem to get what I would call a normal rainstorm. Uh, everything comes down in great velocities and our infrastructure, uh, a lot of it can't handle it. So uh, it's, it's just a pattern that we're seeing. Um, for some reason or other, and I'm at a loss to explain, or, you know, it's been referenced on the national weather sites and NOAA that it's just they're seeing an increased pattern of these events. Um, Bob, you have been notified now. I mean, this is public meeting, and we're now notified that we've got a, what could be potentially a very serious problem here on the other side. And aside from this project, is there something the town can do? I mean, can you at least go out there and examine this and see if there's some solutions out there? I'd mean, be happy to take a look at it. I'm just, I'm not prepared to give you a solution right now. I'm just having well, talk, I don't exactly not walk downstream, now. but I'd be happy to, to look at what's happening downstream and. Uh, you know, we do this, it's, it's very common for us to do this. It is on private property, but, uh, you know, the water that's coming offshore road and emanating again from private property is sort of a combination of flows from both private and the public way. So I would be happy to take a look at it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Can you enlighten us, new folks in town, <laughs> as to when shore road was changed? The I'm in my 30 years with the town, and I wasn't a teenager when I started, but I was close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I'm not aware of any alignment changes. I am aware that in 1965 the right of way was realigned, okay. and maybe portions of the road were realigned at that point, but that's the last redefinition that I'm aware of. And again, I'm not sure if that included a physical realignment. Uh, we've done you know, normal roadway paving on the road twice in my tenure, but I'm not aware of any alignment changes, at least in that area. Since and one of the things I remember we observed when we were out there was the, at one point in the roadway, and I think it was at this near the site, there was some uh, degradation underneath the roadway. Um, is that something you've seen? That's in the Dyer Pond area. Yeah. We have a culvert failure there, and we actually, portion of the culvert has come, become separated from the main section, which we're going to repair that as soon as school is out. Okay. Uh, but that's in the shoulder just north of the Dyer Pond in the section. And that was that from the February? Late February, stuff it, of it? Probably, but over a pattern of events. Okay. Probably created that. That's not the culvert we're talking about. No, it's, it's not. Up, up. Okay. Um, are there any other blocks or, or, or lack of drainage to, that seems to be keeping water in this area more than usual? Uh, I mean, I, I, I heard alluded to that. Uh, you know, essentially, in the vernacular, it's not getting to the ocean like it probably should be. And I, I'm clearly not an engineer, uh, but I didn't know if there was any, any analysis done or proposed or something to look at why that may be happening. I, I really don't know. I mean, okay. it's, it's, there's probably been a traditional water course there. Sure. And just, again, going back to the, the catastrophic events, you know, you get five, nine, seven inches of rain in a 24-hour period. Uh, it's going to go down through that water course at a much higher velocity. But I'm not an engineer, so I don't want to investigate. We just, we've seen, uh, we've received several calls and several concerns about water flows and water problems in the last, really the last five years. Thanks. Any other questions? Go ahead. To respond to you, you asked, oh, you sure. asked Bob, and I'm, I, whether there was any um, changes, any information about changes and I just wanted you to know that I've spoken to Bob Metcalf I've had the pleasure of speaking with several people in Delano Park I've asked all of them if they have any information any engineering studies that could show us why this problem is happening if if there is information out there no one's told me about it. Okay. so we have asked the question right but it sounds like in the letter one of the letters we got referred to the fact that they hired Bob Metcalf to do something right. what, and what I've, I spoke at length oh. with Mr. Metcalf he's um, you know, he's represented applicants before, he's very reputable, sure. and um, 
he he said there's a lot of water coming through there and that didn't always come through there if you look at the size of the trees that are now coming down they clearly would have come down a lot sooner if they didn't have that kind of water before but um, he's he's walked the area he hasn't found a blocked culvert there is a private culvert in there but apparently it appears to still be functional so there's there's no nothing I've heard so far that's the aha why this is happening So how are we going to fix this? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'd be happy to take a look at it. You know, I have a suggestion, and I'm, is you know, frankly, some of this is is way beyond the, what the Our planning board does. And and you know, Mr. Malley and and Maureen work for the town, but the people who fund the fight are the elected officials. So, if, candidly, you know, write to your councilor and say, this is an issue we have out here. We we want some town resources to figure out what the problem is and fix it. If it, and if it's truly a, a town responsibility, you know, the, the folks who get elected or not can respond as well. But, you know, our job as a planning board is to take an application as presented, match them up against the regulations that we have, and see whether the developer complied with the rules and regs that allow development, uh, you know, in the town and in, in the state. And so far, what I'm seeing is an applicant and an application that is not only complied with the regulations, but frankly, have gone above and beyond some of the requirements that we have for a single lot. You know, this isn't like a 20 lot subdivision. So, you know, we have to move very, we've already spent an hour and a half of, on a one lot <laughs> access way permit, and I think we need to sort of apex that to a vote unless any other member has any specific questions for the abutters uh, or the applicant or Mr. Malley, but I think Mr. Malley wants to make a comment too. Oh, I just, no, no, you, I'm all set with you. Unless okay, it, you can can I just make oh. one quick suggestion? To Mr. Malley? Or? To everybody. Okay, good. I would like to suggest to the people in Delano Park, to Bob Malley, and to Maureen, that you all get together and walk this land and talk about it and see if you can't all put your heads together, all smart people, and figure out who you have to get and what you have to do to begin to solve the problem. You know, and frankly, I agree with that suggestion, Barbara, but also, you know, frankly, they work for Mike and for the council, and, you know, they have, it has to come from the, from, from the boss, so to speak. So if that's where the town resources are going to get applied, that's not our call. No, know. I know that, but at least as a starting point to try to, to evaluate the problem. If they give it the green light, I'm sure they'll be happy to do it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, so we have an application in front of us. Public hearing is now closed. We've heard testimony for way longer than we usually do for a single lot access way permit. Does any board member have any questions uh, that they want, feel like they need answered, or the town planner or anyone else that's here in the room? Barbara. I, I have for the applicant. Okay. Um, there was a comment made by Steve Hardy, and I couldn't find anywhere where you that you should reevaluate the 15 inch culvert, that it was shown near the elevation of 25 and a half feet. It was point D on his letter, page three. Did you um, alter that? I, I have. Consider decreasing the slope to raise the outlet. Yeah, I've discussed that uh, through email with Steve, and, and we are uh, on the same page on that. Uh, it is staying the way it is, uh, it is accurate the way it is. And uh, it was just a, a reading of the plan, and uh, we are. Where is that? The, the proposed motion for the board to consider includes the standard oh, the, the letter about the party. that says you have Thank to revise you. the plans to satisfy the town engineer. So instead of speculating about the conversation that two engineers okay. had, I'm just going to rely on that condition. Right. And we if, if, feel confident that we can meet the engineer's okay. comments. If, if, um, if you blast, there is no blasting plan. Uh, not blasting? You, you, no, you, you, there's nothing in the wetland regulations or the private access way permit regulations that so require a blasting, blasting plan. plan. You will, however, need to get a blasting permit through public safety, okay. mm -hmm. which is right. separate from the planning board process. Okay, because sometimes when there's blasting, we have a blasting plan. Sometimes okay. you do. Okay, well, I didn't. Okay. All right. All right. One last question. Has the fire chief approved the turnaround? Yeah. Yes. Okay. He did. Because he said comply with the B40 standard, right? Right. And you did. And we did. Okay. Because I heard that you gave him the templates. I didn't know we, that meant we gave the they, templates he to signed off on it. Review engineer. And it was our understanding 
that the if the turnaround meets the B40 turning template, mm -hmm. that that is the criteria by which the fire chief approves turnarounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Barbara. I'll make a motion. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, findings of fact. That's right. Um, MC Associates is requesting a private access way permit and resource protection permit for a lot located at 1055 Shore Road, which requires review under Section 1979, Private Access Ways, and Section 1983, Resource Protection Permit. As described in the June 7, 2010 submission, during a 25-year storm, 24-hour event, the water entering the 24-inch culvert under Shore Road will increase 0 0.015 acre feet, which is a 0.49% increase in overall runoff volume. The town engineer has recommended information be added to the plans, including confirmation of the turnaround. The applicant has submitted a road maintenance agreement and drainage easement, which is under review by the town attorney. And the application substantially complies with Section 1979, Private Access Ways, and Section 1983, Resource Protection Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of MC Associates for a private access way permit to make the lot buildable and resource protection permit to construct a driveway for a lot located at 1055 Shore Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised per the town engineer's letter, letter dated June 10, 2010. Two, that the applicant provided a, a signed road maintenance agreement and drainage easement in the form acceptable to the town attorney and town manager. Three, that a note be added to the plans that no structure shall be constructed outside the building envelope. And four, that the plans and materials be revised for the above conditions and submitted to the town planner prior to the recording of the plans. All set? All set. I have a motion made by Eliza Quinn. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Jim Huebner. Um, any discussion on the motion? We have in front of us the uh, E40 turning template. template. Mm -hmm. Has the fire chief actually seen this? Because I don't have anything indicating that the fire chief actually looked at this. And if not, I would think we might want to add a, a, condition. a condition that the applicant um, submit plans showing adequate turning radius to accommodate emergency vehicles as confirmed by the fire chief. Great. What? Because according to the letter, I think what Maureen's looking up is one of the findings. Number three says the town engineer has recommended information be added. Is yeah, it's in the town engineer's letter. It's in the town engineer's letter. And to be, to be fair, um, the fire chief is very good at maneuvering a truck on an existing area and being able to say whether or not he can turn it around but his expertise is not in reviewing engineering plans. Sure. He relies on the engineer to make sure that the turnaround is going to meet the needs of the ladder truck, and we know that the closest approximation for the ladder truck is the B-40 vehicle. That's why that keeps getting Plus. mentioned. So as long as the engineer says it can meet the B-40 vehicle, the fire chief's going to say he's okay with it. But if you want to add his approval into that, you can. It's just, you know, he, like he relies on, yeah. He relies on the town engineer to, to do that check. So just so I can keep the record moving forward, Elaine, are you proposing to amend Liza's motion? Yes, I, we can actually take off the part about the approval of the fire chief and simply say that the applicant submit plans showing adequate turnaround radius to accommodate emergency vehicles. I guess one of my problems relying on the town engineer's letter is it's one of those paragraphs where he kind of talks about around the issue, but doesn't, doesn't, directly, doesn't directly say what it is that he's supposed to do about the issue. Okay. So, so with that amendment, is that uh, yep. acceptable to the movement? And second? Mm -hmm. okay. Can I have that again, please? <laughs> that the applicant submit plans showing adequate turnaround radius to accommodate emergency vehicles. I want to say the B40. B40. No. Okay. I don't want to clog it up anymore. Right. It is. Okay. I think that's going to be fine. Yeah. Okay. Did you get all that? No, I got it. Did you? Did you? Okay. 
Motion made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed to the motion. Motion carries 7 nothing. We're going to take a five minute recess. Thank you. And just for the record, the next item on the agenda will be the Shore Road Path Completeness Review. Path Site Plan Resource Protection Permit. Um, this is a permit request by the Town of Cape Elizabeth requesting site plan review and resource protection permit to construct Shore Road Path, a two mile long off road path located on Shore Road from the old entrance to Fort Williams next to the pond to the town center. Section 19 9, site plan completeness, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness. What we have on for review tonight is completeness. Uh, it's not a public hearing. We will, be, we will be scheduling that for the next meeting, but if, if the app, if, yeah, if, it's, if it's deemed complete. Um, and we have the applicant at the podium. If he could identify himself, make his presentation, we'll consider the issue of, issue of completeness. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates, and uh, I represent the Town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, with me this evening is Gary Collette and Todd Gaiman from AMEC, and uh, Betsy Melrose from Mitchell & Associates. Um, this presentation is... And? I'm sorry. One more person. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Bob Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> he really wasn't here only for the last one. Um, this uh, presentation, this PowerPoint presentation consists of, there are 20 slides that uh, run from the beginning of the pathway, which is at Fort Williams Park, and uh, extends to the town center. Um, included in the presentation are photographs of uh, existing conditions. There are two or three photographs on each slide that illustrate uh, some of the existing conditions. Uh, as well as there are seven photo simulations that were done previously uh, in, the, uh, in, in the conceptual study uh, that, show, look, that will show what the existing path will look like uh, in a three-dimensional form. Um, and you'll see, in the present, you'll see from the presentation that this uh, truly was not a simple task of just drawing two parallel lines um, along Shore Road. You know, all the site conditions vary um, all the way up uh, for the two-mile section. Um, and, uh, but we believe that, that we have been uh, sensitive to the site character, and it was truly a, a balance uh, trying to, try to create uh, pedestrian safety with preservation of, of the, uh, the character. So, uh, beginning at uh, Fort Williams, this is the gated uh, entrance to Fort Williams near the, the pond and the tennis court. Uh, the pathway begins, uh, the dash line on the left represents a future connection that would run down to the, the main entrance to Fort Williams. But our project begins uh, where the brown um, pathway is illustrated. And it runs, uh, meanders its way through the, uh, the large green esplanade. Uh, there are several oak trees along this route. Uh, it will cross the, uh, there's an existing um, secondary exit to the Fort Williams Park. 
Um, and in that, at that point, we are proposing to relocate the existing fence um, inside uh, the Fort Williams, approximately 15 feet. And the reason that we're proposing this is to uh, allow the pedestrian to use the pathway uh, during those hours that the fort is, is closed. Um, and there's not enough room in between the existing edge pavement and the stone wall uh, to place the pathway. It continues up to uh, where we're proposing the first of two crosswalks. And this is roughly at the crest of the hill uh, that offers uh, good sight distance, or sight distance that meets the uh, DOT uh, standards in either direction. Uh, there's, a, there's, a short, yeah, there's a short little section here that we're proposing to uh, connect to the existing green belt pathway. Um, but it will cross, I'm sorry, it will cross at this point. Uh, there will be uh, two uh, pedestrian activated solar panel uh, signals. Uh, the pedestrian will activate it and uh, it will start flashing uh, before the pedestrian crosses the crosswalk. It will be one in facing in both directions. Can I ask you one question? As you go through this, if you have made changes from what we saw on our site walk to any, the crosswalk is the first thing. Would you just highlight that as you go through? Otherwise, I'm going to assume that this is essentially what we saw okay. on our site walk. So highlight any changes that, uh, as a result of the, the site visit or from the site visit. Anything that's different than as we saw it at the site walk. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. Um, I don't think there have been any changes so far. Uh, so the, the pathway uh, continues down. Uh, you'll see that we're proposing to put the pathway on um, the other side, uh, the land side of the uh, a row of mature spruce. And we're coming out back onto a longshore road um, and continuing down. There, there is a. Uh, if you remember from the site visit, there is a 30-inch uh, twin oak tree uh, in this location here. Um, initially, we had uh, recommended preserving that, but I believe that the majority of the planning board members felt that, um, especially in light of the, the landowner wanting the, the tree to, uh, to uh, be removed, the majority of the planning board members felt that in, in light of safety, they felt that the tree should come down and that the pathway uh, should, that we should create a wider separation um, as a buffer. Uh, so the pathway continues down and at, in this location, um, in this location here, there's an existing guardrail, as shown on the photo below. Uh, we're proposing to uh, remove the metal guardrail and replace it with a, a timber guardrail. Um, the pathway would, uh, there would be a retaining wall along this section of the pathway, a small retaining wall to, um, uh, to take up the, the grade along this section of the road. Uh, it crosses Diapon Road, yeah, Diapon Road, and continues up along the, uh, the guardrail section. And again, we're going to replace this with a timber guardrail section. There's a photo simulation of what the pathway would look like. And if you remember, there's a, there's a nice shelf along this section of the roadway um, that would lend itself to a uh, five-foot wide pathway. Continuing up, um, the uh, roughly in this section right here, uh, damn, this is sensitive. Um, we're proposing to place the pathway adjacent to Shore Road with a six-inch vertical curb. It would be a it would be a Cape Cod. 
uh, bituminous curve. <coughs> and uh, this is primarily because of the, uh, the ledge and topographic conditions in this area. Uh, it would cross a, a private driveway, and in this area, the right-of-way uh, right becomes very narrow. In fact, the pathway is, is uh, adjacent to the edge of the pathway in this location. Um, beginning in, in this point, beginning at that point, uh, we are proposing a raised boardwalk, and it continues uh, it continues to this point. And this, this land right here is the land that uh, you just reviewed, the MC, is it MC Associates. Um, and we're showing where the proposed driveway, a private access way, would be located. Um, so it runs along here. Um, and this is the beginning of Robinson Woods this property line, and there's a, some, an outcrop of ledge here that would going to be required to be um, blasted. And then the, and then the pathway runs uh, within the right-of-way all the way along Robinson Woods uh, in this location we've got a, an existing wetland uh, and you can see that the pathway is a bit closer to the um, to Shore Road. I think that's a, uh, a two-foot buffer right there. Uh, so it goes around the wetland, and then at that point, we're traversing the ledge outcrop. This is where the, the large led, ledge outcrop is. Uh, so we, we come up on top of the ledge, and then we run all the way along the top of the ledge, and then we traverse back down again. Um, in this location, there's a, an existing, uh, actually there are twin culverts, um, and we're proposing an elevated boardwalk uh, over, those, over the, the head of the culverts there to allow drainage from both the shore road to enter and for the sheet runoff coming off Robinson Woods to enter the culvert. Uh, that's, a, that's a detail that's shown on the, in the set of drawings. I don't know if you're here for the entire presentation on the previous application, but is this no. the cul culvert? They were, no, it's not. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, somebody, somebody, one of the abutters had asked a question what's going to happen when the path goes over that section. Oh, there. There's, there's a culvert right there, Peter. So the proposal for the path. He doesn't want me to use this, right? He doesn't. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's the culvert there. What, what is the proposal for the path? Just to go over it and extend the culvert up a little bit, or is there enough room I believe, existing? I believe, uh, are we extending the culvert in that location? No. The boardwalk's, the boardwalk's going to go over. Oh, that's right. That, this is in the section of the raised boardwalk, and it will just go over it oh. without disturbing any of it. So any it doesn't need to be added to or changed or anything? Right. But you're talking about the MC Associates. No, part. the culvert no. exists already. The 24 inch that was replaced in 89. One of the abutters asked what's going to happen when the past goes I wanted an answer tonight yeah. on the record. Essentially, the proposal there is a boardwalk over that site. And there's no reason to, no need nor reason to extend it. Correct. Well, that, Easy problem solved. Okay, thanks, John. I didn't mean to hold you up. I thought. Yep. Um, I was still uh, um, running along uh, the frontage of Robinson Woods, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we we were not allowed to place the pathway within the Robinson Woods, um, and as a result of that, it, it's you know we're. we're having to clear a lot more trees um, than originally we had hoped. Uh, but because of topographical and ledge conditions, there are a number of oak trees along this section of Robinson Woods that will have to be removed. 
Um, and you can see that the pathway is running um, roughly along the, uh, on top of the slope along the, the right of way. And then this section is where we uh, meet the existing gravel uh, parking area, the, the trailhead of Robinson Woods. Um, this, we're picking up the, the pathway at this section and running it along. You can see this large uh, section of wetland here, uh, which we're not impacting at all. Um, this is the, where the, uh, the culverts are in DuPont Cove. Uh, and we're um, proposing a footbridge in this location. And you can see in the, this, set, this photo here, um, we showed a photo simulation of uh, the footbridge and how the pathway would be aligned. Uh, continuing up in front of Pond Cove, uh, these are existing bollards that were placed by the uh, uh, by the individual landowner um, and what we're proposing to do is to remove these bollards, they're all within the right of way, um, and to replace the bollards with a wooden guardrail um, and a pathway behind the guardrail. The timber. timber guardrail, correct. Uh, the pathway comes up. This section right here is adjacent to an existing wetland and we're proposing a small retaining wall along the outer edge of that, of that pathway section. This is Old Colony Lane. Uh, and then the pathway runs up. Um, we've got good separation, five foot wide separation. At this point, uh, there is an existing culvert and we're going to sort of sweep the pathway um, a little closer to Shore Road in this location, provide a new head wall um, to preserve the end of the culvert. And the pathway continues up. Uh, you can see from the lines that there is some uh, topography in this area. <coughs> Uh, and then it runs up. Uh, this is Smuggler's Cove Road, and the pathway um, uh, goes a little closer to Shore Road because of the vegetation in this area here. Uh, I think we have a three-foot separation in this section. Um, in this section, uh, which is illustrated on this photograph, uh, we have the opportunity to go inside the vegetation and preserve some of the trees uh, along the very edge of Shore Road. And the pathway would run uh, in the middle of the, the trees and then come out again at this point. And we did a, another photo simulation. Uh, can, you, can you go back on yeah. the slides? I'm sorry. I'm yep. You're going quickly, which is why I asked you to do it. Uh, there was a... Uh, the woman who on the sidewalk who was expressing concern about what would be facing her property, right, uh, just past Pond Cove, right, just past those bollards. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't have. Well, the, well, there, there will be a retaining wall. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Um, I believe it's this. Uh, Wait a minute. Um, I think it's the next. Here. Is it there? Here. Right here. No, right here. Right here. Yeah. Yes. There's a small retaining wall, um, and in your in your booklet, in the submission booklet, there's an illustration of the type of retaining wall that we're proposing. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. It's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a concrete, it's a precast concrete segmental retaining wall, and we chose one that is more decorative, more residential than commercial. Um, it has, it has, I think it has some nice character 
to it. There's a blend of colors. It's not all gray or all brown. Um, and, I, and I'm looking at just the quick calculation is the exposed face is five or six feet facing the homeowner. Sound about right? Words, of vertical height? Is vertical height? From, from the ground to the top of the shelf facing back toward the homeowner. They're going to see a five foot face. Does that sound about right? Uh, Gary. And that, you know just top of the wall, 16 feet, bottom of the wall, 12.5, quick math, 5 feet. All right? Yeah, even less. That's the hut. That At the most things yes. they're going to say. Right. Yeah, she seemed concerned about that. But right. It's, it's broken up. It's residential looking. It's not a solid concrete wall. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, we, we also did a photo simulation of the area where we went inside the vegetation, uh, which is difficult to see, but um, the pathway enters here and runs along inside the woods and then exits at this point here. Then it runs, um, this is an area where we're, uh, as you can say, we're shifting the pathway a little closer to Shore Road because of these three uh, existing uh, ornamental crabapple trees. Um, and they will require some pruning of lower branches, but uh, we felt that it would deserve to be preserved. Um, then we have uh, a good separation here. This section is illustrated um, on this photo simulation. The pathway runs along the stone wall. <clears throat> um, this area, uh, if you remember, has a large ledge outcrop which is very close to um, to the roadway. And so we're pushing the pathway adjacent to Shore Road, again utilizing a curb section, a six inch curb, so the pathway will be raised at that point, but we're able to preserve uh, the, uh, the ledge in this area. And yeah, I'm sorry, th this photo shows the ledge and we did a photo simulation showing how the pathway would run adjacent to the shore road and then swing back. <clears throat> uh, in this section, uh, this is the Baba property and uh, during the, the initial study they expressed a willingness to allow us to uh, bring the pathway onto their property um, and we were able to save uh, a lot of vegetation along Shore Road, uh, and then it comes back out again. And um, in this area, uh, we let's see. In this area, uh, this is the the Barber property, I believe. Let me see. Okay, I'm sorry. This is this is the driveway entrance to the Barber property, and uh, there's, as you can see in the photo, there's a lot of uh, existing shrubs. There's some junipers and yews, um, and uh, they're all within the right of way. And we're proposing to remove those to uh, to develop the pathway, but we're also going to. Uh, replace a lot of these shrubs, uh, new shrubs, and this box represents the area on the planting plan. You re if you refer to the planting plan, you'll see uh, the proposed planting we're going to include in this area. So you are staying in the right of way on the Barber property? Well, this is the, I'm sorry, this, this is the driveway entrance to the Barber property. The following is the Baba property continues to this point here. Mm -hmm. 
and in this section we are proposing to run the pathway on partially onto their property. Uh, this area we have uh, some topographical issues to deal with and we're proposing to uh, run the pathway and there be a, a retaining wall uh, in the lower section, uh, a small retaining wall, this is about a, this is about a three foot uh, drop. Retaining wall against the roadway path lower than the roadway? No, the, the, the retaining wall would run along this edge with the pathway being raised. Level of the roadway? Yeah. I wasn't clear from the sidewalk. Sidewalk. Yeah. Um, now we're running along, this is Julianne Lane. Um, there are um, some retaining walls in this area also, which would, um, on the following photo simulation, it shows a small retaining wall um, along the top, and the pathway would be lower than Shill Road. And in this area, once we cross Julian Lane, uh, the second crossing, pedestrian crossing, occurs in this location. Um, and this location offers excellent sight distance. It's a long stretch of Shill Road uh, with more than enough sight distance in either direction. And then it would run up on the opposite side of Shore Road. Um, Excuse me, John? Yes. You want to back? We had a lot of discussion about that big oak tree. No. Uh, the pine tree. The pine tree. Yeah. That tree. Right. Um, why did we have the crosswalk from prior to that tree? Um, there is a condition across the street that uh, made it very difficult. If oh, you remember, right. remember there's a stone wall right okay. there, and it would have meant um, disturbing that stone wall. And is Actually, there was clearance under that pine. Well, there was. We thought there was, but I, I'm sure. I, we've, I mean, we've determined I said, that <laughs> we've determined that there is enough clearance with the removal of. Uh, there are a couple. A couple uh, wild cherry trees located right here. And you can see the pathway does a little jog here. Um, so with the removal of those two cherry trees, we're able to, to get around that lower limb. The pathway would run up. Uh, now in this section, um, we've got some topographical conditions and some existing vegetation that we'd like to preserve. So we're proposing a curved section which would run from this driveway all the way up to the Rand property at this portion. And then um, the pathway jogs in to get some separation. And this is the area where the uh, existing lilac is a, is a row or a hedge of existing lilacs that will have to be removed. And again, we're proposed, this box refers to the planting plan. We're proposing to replace those lilacs with new, a new lilac hedge on their property. And then the, the pathway uh, meanders up and connects to the existing sidewalk in front of the doctor's office in this location here. That's the last section showing the existing sidewalk. <coughs> Thanks, John. Have you uh, done your presentation? Yes. Okay. Any uh, questions the board has for the applicant, keeping in mind the issue we have before us tonight is whether the application is sufficient, sufficiently complete that we can start considering on its merits. Any other questions, thoughts? 
I have a question. I knew you would. I know. Um, and this isn't really for you, John. It's a question about financial capability. I am really troubled by how that's written. It's so loosey-goosey that if this, if the fundraisers come up with enough to put in 100 feet, then we can go ahead. I mean, there are no benchmarks, and I really think that the financial statement needs to be a lot more stringent than it is. We always require we would never do this for an individual project. And I know we did this with the Arboretum, but I see that very differently because we funded it in areas. So it's not sort of helter-skelter. I think this could lead to enormous problems. I'd, I'd offer a comment on that. The point of the, of the financial capability rule is to, is to assure that uh, a developer can complete a project, essentially. Um, this is a situation where the town's the applicant. Mm -hmm. We could get to the stage where the site plan is approved and there simply is never any funding. That's entirely possible here. I hope not, but that's a different issue. So I, I'm comfortable with the way it's written because um, it is the town that's the applicant. It's a municipality. It's always subject to the public political approval process to get the funding that's necessary. But for good or bad, or, or we hope, there's no danger the applicant's going to go bankrupt and, and leave us with a half-finished half, big, half finished project. There's, there's no danger of that, I don't think, Peter. But the danger is that the town is then going to come back and, and you know, we're going to have another referendum. I, I just think it's so loose, the way it's written now, that if a little bit of money was raised, a little tiny bit of the past might be put in, and then maybe no more money would be raised for the next year or two. And I would just like to see something, and I may be the only one, a little bit tighter in terms of the financial capability. But, but, or the but that's not whether security. the site plan... I mean, is, is, is ultimately uh, safe or, or approvable. I mean, I, I, have no, I have no trouble with it, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really comfortable asking the applicant to modify that. I'm surprised if I really disagree. You know, I'll, I'll, oh. <laughs> if I could just say one, yes. one thing to that. You know, in, in um, a lot of developments that I've been involved with, the financial letter that we submit is very loosey goosey. I guess that's true. It's not true. a commitment letter. It's you know, you know, this applicant is in good standing, and you know, we've worked with them before. Tomorrow they may not be. <laughs> right. So I, I don't really see. It know, didn't help us with the nursing home. I mean, ultimately that project got foreclosed on the, the old Viking. Oh, that's true yeah. too. I mean, it only goes right. as far as is the market will will support. I don't like private that, applicant. But and for a public app, then it's, it's even more subject to the political process. So I'm not really willing to ask it to change. Plus, is that a complete issue? as well? Any other? Are you all set, Barbara? Can I follow up on Barbara's sure. comment? I guess one of the things maybe she's thinking about is, is there some place where construction could stop and leave things in an unsafe condition? That's a fair point. Dumping people, you know, ending the path at a spot that wasn't appropriate. Um, and that's what I would be concerned about. Something like that doesn't apply to the Arboretum, but it certainly could here. Mm -hmm. Or it could be so that um, phasing. Do you have actually, have you actually broken it down to say if we start, and I'm not sure where you would start the phase, my assumption is the fort, and then how much it would cost to bring it up to Robinson Woods? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we haven't uh, prepared a phasing plan per se. But I mean, if 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 we only um, if the private uh, group raises a hundred thousand and the town gets four hundred thousand, we may propose to do half of the project from Fort Williams to say Robinson Woods, and we would come back to the planning board, I think, in that case, and and propose a phasing plan. You mean assuming approval? And then if it only were half funded, you'd have to come back with a phasing plan amendment to the previously approved subject That's right. uh, site plan. That's right. Yeah. So I don't think that there would be a case where we would have that we wouldn't have enough sufficient funds to do the project. If we don't have sufficient funds, we're not going to do the project. But we may do half of it, whatever the but the approval would run for the whole thing. 
Yes. So in order yes, to do something less than what was approved, you would have to come back for back with a phase of plan, correct. And how long from commencement of construction until completion under this the permit it would be a three year period or if it was all done in one project? Right. Oh no, it would be it would be one year, one season. Yeah. So is that what the regulation is once construction start there there's a is there a, a site plan approval requirement that once construction starts it must be completed by a particular date no you just have to pull a permit within within a year and then you can yeah, start to renewal you can pull you can extend that with it for another i mean one, once you start construction your 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 site plan is can, your site plan approval is um can't can't expire at that point then you're functioning under the building permit rules the building permits are good for six months but they can be extended so, I mean, once a project starts, the planning board is pretty much out of it unless they want to amend the plans. And it could start before the funding was complete? Or do they have to, does the funding have to be complete? Financial capacity established by a completed fundraising before the construction starts? That's, that's flexible. That's what? I didn't hear it's flexible. There's nothing in the site plan regulations that explicitly say that. So I feel like knowing the applicant, the town of Cape Elizabeth, it's of little risk. Now, if it were the city of Portland, I would worry, <laughs> knowing what happened to the ocean terminal and um, the fire boat. But um, I really don't think that our city councilors would let that happen. And if I look at the, the city of Portland situation, say that ocean gateway, it's not the, it, the planning board equivalent of Portland. They just approve it. It's the city council and the town manager's job to make sure that it's executed. So I just think we're overreaching if we put mandates on um, that all the, you know, the money has to be earmarked before it is st it, we begin construction. And as I remind the public. As much as I don't want to be like Portland, this is I don't think that's our job. For completeness right now. Do you think right. there's more information we need from a completeness standpoint to determine? I mean, this may be the merits of, not, merits of approval or not issue. approval. But I don't see that there's any more data that we need from the town to determine financial capability. I agree with you. I did have two completeness questions. Fire away. Um, one has to do with access and parking. You make the assumption in your materials that the construction of the path will not generate any additional traffic or any additional cars that need to be parked. And I guess I would question that assumption. Um, I think it's something that needs to be looked at a little harder, um, looking at the parking regulations, you don't fit into any of the categories for required parking, but there is an other catch-all category that says the planning board could require parking. And I just think of my own situation. I don't live on Shore Road, and I never walk or bike on Shore Road because it's not safe currently. But if there's a path there, I might in fact take my car and park it somewhere in order to be able to use the path. So it strikes me that, in fact, this might generate some additional car trips. There may be an easy answer that the logical place to park is Fort Williams, and so the parking, or, or, or the town, or town hall. hall, so that the parking is taken care of. But it still seems to me that you need to provide us that information rather than just saying there is no impact. And to me, that is a completeness issue. And the other completeness issue, um, and this one I guess is in part a question for Maureen, uh, in the private access way permit, we had all sorts of diagrams about flow and drainage, and we were concerned about whether there were arrows on the plan or not on the plan. Here we have nothing other than we're going to deal with the DEP on this. And my question is, that may be the appropriate forum to deal with it, but as far as I'm concerned, the information on drainage issues and water flow issues is not complete, at least in my layman sense, as to what is a complete package well, of information. You, you don't have nothing. I mean, these, these documents have the whole pathway is graded. The whole pathway shows drainage, the catch basin pipes. Maybe, not I'm not, maybe, and, and maybe I'm not reading it well, but when I tried to 
compare the degree of information I saw on this with the specificity of information we had for that one single lot, it just seems to me that perhaps appropriately, you're waiting to prepare that more specific information for the DEP um, and not for us. And then you would then give to us what you prepare for and, and show the DEP. But is our packet of information complete in this regard until that information is prepared? And maybe this is typical if we have a project that's also getting other levels of approval and we traditionally consider this to be complete. But for me, there's a whole chunk of information that's not at the level of specificity I would expect. Or maybe I'm not reading the plan. I would argue that it is complete, and, and maybe the only, the only element that is not complete is the area where we're proposing to mitigate, which is at Fort Williams. And that is, is an illustration in your packet that shows the area. Um, but, but the documents are graded, drained. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of drainage along Shore Road now that will accommodate uh, the runoff in this area. Perhaps I'm not sophisticated enough to take that information from the plans I have in front of me. So, Jim, if you're not troubled by it, I'm not concerned. If, if you see enough there, then, then perhaps we have enough. I'm not either. There. It's, it's a different type of development. I mean, this was clearly, you know, a lot of some cre the potential creation of some surface that isn't going to drain anymore. This is a, a strip that runs a long distance, but its impact on drainage is fairly minimal and can be mitigated fairly easily. I, I did see that in there, what John was talking about, except for those points with, uh, that you referred to, and I, I don't know the answer to that, Marie, you can uh, enlighten us on that regarding DEP. I mean, well, we, we, I, mean, I, I think one of the problems is that you don't have the letter that you usually have to lean on from the town engineer saying he's reviewed it and these are the issues. And I mean, in the memo that I've given you, we've raised this issue. Do you want to have a town engineering right review? And um, if you do, you know, we can retain uh, our backup engineer to do the review of this. And who's that? Um, we usually use Steve Bradstreet. I believe he's with Oak Engineering. They're, they keep changing their name. but I actually think that would be prudent. But that's, that's a little, I mean, I actually brought this up with the, with the chair at the workshop, but you can't make decisions at workshops, so this was the first time you could even discuss this issue, was now. And, you know, you could, you could have, I mean, I can call him, and for next month's meeting, you can have a review by the engineer. Um, it just it's, seems to me, knowing that there is public opposition in the town, and very concerned opposition to many aspects of the construction of the path. It seems to me that we would be well served to have as much information as we can to present to the public while not wasting money. And again, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to have that independent review, whether enough of your plans are in and complete. Which, which issue are you talking about? Because I think the two issues I'd have with the engineer review would be money and time. I mean, if, if, if you felt it was appropriate to, and it could be done before, you're, you're looking to get on the, potentially get on the July public, meet, public hearing. Uh, uh, let's see. I believe so, yes. So he would have sufficient time to review this? I believe so. I, I don't think that's a consideration. I think we need to decide whether we think it's appropriate, because it's not exactly arm's length to have the engineer, for the town be the engineer for the town project. And if we decide that it's appropriate to have, have another party come in and take a look at this, then I don't think timing matters. If it holds it up for a month, holds it up. Well, could I just, I mean, if, let's, let's pretend it isn't the town as the applicant, however. I don't think this board has ever expected an applicant to go through the expense of being unduly delayed because the town hasn't been able to pull its act together. So I think the burden is on the town 
as the reviewer to get another engineer in place to review these plans in sufficient time that's fine. so that this applicant doesn't have to get held up on their schedule. Well, you're, if you're telling me that's probably likely. That say I'm that. saying that I, I feel confident that we can pull that off. Okay. So, so are we talking about having an independent engineer review it for completeness or review the final plan? To review the, it's it's the planning board's decision but again what you know, if this was MC Associates and they had submitted all their information in a timely manner and the town had failed to hire an engineer to do the review would you hold up that applicant or would you say okay we'll just make sure we have a review in place for next month I, I don't think that this really has to do so much with completeness no, I, I think this has to do with beyond completeness and that we can vote for completeness tonight and say we would like to have a review by a, 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 a third party engineer to make sure that some of these questions are answered to everybody's satisfaction. It's fine with me. From an engineering perspective, I don't think it's necessary, but I understand why you're concerned, just for the record. So. Well, but I think it, I think it actually looks bad not to. And, and I think in light of think some questions. I think uh, I also agree. I would agree with Elaine. I, I, I do think we need to, but I don't think it should hold up completeness. I do. No, think I don't we need either. To address the parking recitation, John. I mean, I do think we need to explain how that's going to be taken care of. I don't think it's going to be a big deal, but I think it needs to be more we'll document. more than right. just oh, it's not going to make any impact. Yep. So I, I'm not willing to hold it up for completeness tonight on that issue. Elaine, I want to make sure you were done on your comments because I. Yes, those were the only two areas that I had. Any other Complete questions, questions the board has one for completeness, given those two issues? Hearing none, I invite a motion. I'll make a motion. He had ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct the Shore Road path, a two mile long off road path located adjacent to Shore Road from the old entrance to Fort Williams near the pond to the town center be deemed complete. Motion never been made by Elaine Fallander. I hear a second. Seconded by Liza Quinn. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion? Motion carries 7 nothing. Um, we've deemed the application complete. Uh, do we want to have a public hearing on this? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm shocked. Uh, actually, the other question that Maureen reminded me is, do we want to have another site block? I'm not interested in doing that. I don't know. Not yet. Maybe after the public hearing. Well, Something we'll see what the result is. Yeah. Uh, it, as of right now, my my preference would be to not schedule another site block. Do I have any strong opposition to that? Yeah. What? Well, oh, I agree. Sorry. Yeah. The, um, so the next motion would be the motion to set it for public hearing. Do I have a motion? Be it ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular July 20, 2010 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Motion having been made by Elaine Fallender. Do I have a second? Seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion? Is that an affirmative? Oh, yeah. <laughs> motion carries 7 nothing. We will have a public hearing on the. Uh, I have one more question for John, and maybe this is Maureen too. The PowerPoint presentation, is that available? The IT file that we just saw for plenty of members? Um, you can. Is it available for available what? available to me. So that, that PowerPoint presentation, yeah. can you submit that? To the town? Yeah, just so I can have it to, to review. Yeah. I find that easier. It's easier to follow on that as I read the plans because the plans are awful small and right. sometimes they, yep. it's easier to have both going at the same time. So if we can get that, that would, that would help me quite a bit identify uh, probably the half dozen or so areas that I want to be question, you know, query about at the time of the public hearing. Any other? Any other? We're all set, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will Thanks. we adjourn? Seconded. Seconded. Oh. <laughs> all in favor of the motion? Aye. <laughs> <laughs>